Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's training industry webinar, Understanding the Modern Learner is Key to Improving Organizational Efficiencies, sponsored by TTA, known as the Training Associates. I'm Elizabeth Parker, Marketing and Event Specialist at Training Industry, and I'm so happy you could join us for today's event. Before we get started, I have just a few housekeeping items to help you interact with our speaker and get the most out of today's program. Throughout the event, please feel free to submit questions in your Q&A panel and we will address them towards the end of the program. We also encourage you to share the information you receive today with your colleagues and network via social media. Please include the handle TTA training and the hashtag TI webinars so we're able to track your contribution to the conversation. When the program ends, you will see that a short evaluation survey has popped open in your browser, and we would greatly welcome your feedback about the content, speaker, and anything else you might like to share. And as always, today's event will be recorded and archived on trainingindustry.com, and you'll receive a follow-up email from us later on today with a link to the on-demand program that you can share with your team. I know a lot of you, this is your first webinar with us, so a special welcome goes out to you. At Training Industry, we offer near 100 webinars each year on subjects ranging from learning technologies, authenticity, leadership training, emotional intelligence, content development. We cover just about every topic relevant to leaders of training organizations around the globe. And if you have attended one of the programs in the past, thanks so much for joining us again. Now today, it's my pleasure to introduce you to your presenters. Jasmine Marty Robin and Amy Duranay. Jasmine is the Vice President of Marketing at TTA. She is passionate about creating an engaged organizational culture and leading with effective performance and learning practices. Dr. Marty Rosian is a widely published author and a frequent keynote or featured speaker at conferences. Her work has been covered in publications such as the New York Times, Chicago Tribune, the Toronto Star, Jasmine earned her PhD in law, policy, and society from Northeastern University, where over the course of four years, she taught courses on social psychology, the sociology of business, and organizational behavior. Amy DuVernay is the Director of Training Manage Manager Development at Training Industry, where she oversees all processes related to training manager professional development, including program development and evaluation. She has, pub she has published extensively in leading peer-reviewed journals and presented at national conferences, workshops, and educational webinars on topics such as training methods, career development, and training evaluation. She holds a PhD in industrial organizational psychology from North Carolina State University. And with that, ladies, the floor is now yours. Hello. Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for joining our webinar. We are excited to spend this hour with you today. And um, I just want to thank everyone in training industry for putting this webinar to together and for you dedicating this one hour on this very exciting subject. And I'm impressed with the audience that's joining us from far and wide, from New York City to Atlanta to San Francisco, Lima, Peru, Sao Paulo, Brazil, it's a really wide audience. The important thing is that uh, the organizational behavior issues are not interesting to just the US, but they, they are the same because human beings are fundamentally the same. So the whatever we take away from this is relevant to people all over the world. Um, when we talk about this study, first of all, let me share the fundamentals. The study was conducted uh, over two years, so it's a longitudinal study. Uh, the Training Associates PTA uh, sponsored it, and Training Industry with Amy DuVernay as the lead researcher conducted it. It's a very in-depth study uh, that interviewed over the course of two years 1,001 individuals. We had to get that one in for safety to keep the 1,000 number in. And those people had collectively attended 2,366 training sessions, each over the previous 12 months, which, by the way, is an interesting statistic because, by the way, it's a pretty large sample, and it talks about that maybe organizations are not investing that much into training because 
2.4 training sessions across a 12-month period is not a gigantic number. But again, some people may, may be looking at this, oh, okay, let's see what we're doing with these training sessions and how it goes. One key factor that we try to account for was to uh, look at the perspective, the view of the learner. Very often training is done in organizations only because it's a check mark, there is a manager somewhere in HR that needs to show compliance with this or that. But when we do that, and when we approach training as a check mark issue, we're really missing out on a gigantic strategic opportunity to properly invest in our organizations, in our employees, and build engagement. And why is the marketplace context important today? Unlike what we were seeing in the marketplace 10 years ago with the gigantic crash on Wall Street and the recession that set in, we are thankfully in an economy that's actually roaring. And with that, we are experiencing record uh, low unemployment numbers, 3.7%. Uh, it hasn't been that low in over 50 years in North America, in the United States. So that's a huge, uh, hugely low number, which means there is a real war on talent. I was recently at the Brandon Hall conference where somebody told the joke about, oh, there was a war on talent, talent won. So the war is over. And part of the war on talent is instead of going outside and searching for talent outside, uh, which a lot of research shows that it costs two and a half times as much per annual salary of the employee that you're trying to place as keeping a good employee within the organization, uh, one of the ways to actually do that and one of the strongest predictors of people staying is when organizations in invest in them and people actually stay in the organization. So the relevance of this study is not just about learning modality, it's not contextually small. Actually, the context of the relevance of this study is humongous in making sure that people are really staying within the organization, growing within the organization. When people are trained, uh, there was a Deloitte study that showcases people who are trained, they have an understanding that the organization is investing in them and there is a future that they will have organization. So that's fundamentally really important. Uh, hence, we're looking at the learning uh, modalities and what learners want. The other thing that's important about this marketplace is how we use information has really drastically changed, not just over the past 20 years, not since 1995 when internet became widely used, not since 2005 when it had greater adoption with about 70% of the population having immediate access to it, but even in the past two, three years. We are now consuming so much of the internet, over 50% of it, on our mobile devices. Everybody has a computer in their hands. So how then we're using the information has huge repercussions on how, perceived, how people want to get their training. And that's on different levels. So understanding people's needs and catering to them in a way that people are experiencing information and looking for is vastly important. Hence the importance of this study and why we undertook it. Uh, now we'd like to understand the audience a little bit more and we have a poll question we'd like you to, to, uh, to respond to. We'll take about a minute to do this. I'll read the question. So have you proactively reached out to your learners to identify their learning preferences? Your response options are yes, no, or do not know. Please, uh, you know, Elizabeth, you wanted to do a countdown? Sure thing, Jasmine. It uh, looks like about 58% of our, our audience has put in a response there. So let's give them just a couple more moments here. Fantastic. We'll give people a couple of moments and I'll repeat the question. Have you proactively reached out to our learners to identify their learning preferences? Yes, no, do not know. By the way, there's a lot of you know, language about empowerment. This question is trying to get to that, right? To make learners as engaged people. Learning is part of being an engaged employee, which is really critical. Everybody's talking about culture, but one of the surest ways to deliver on a vibrant, vital culture is to have those engaged employees. Elizabeth, do we have the responses in? Yep, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up this poll and share the results with you. There you go.
Oh, fantastic. So a little over five, almost two, um, let's see, three-fifths, 57%, have reached out to their learners to ask about their preferences. Conversely, uh, almost the other, you know, 34% have not reached out, uh, and 11% uh, do not know. This is very useful to know. So even though more than half have actually reached out to their learners, which is really progressive and a welcome thing, and by the way, maybe because that's why you're also interested in being in this webinar, you're progressive that way, but a good half almost has not necessarily reached out. So these are really telling things. Ideally, we would like to see a universe where over 90% have reached out to learners, building that level of engagement. Um, so the voice of the learner. Why is the voice of the learner important? Again, it goes into building a culture of engaged employees. Today's employees really expect, again, they have choices, they can vote with their feet, and you want to have the engagement in a way that they feel valued, that they feel that their voice is heard, that you have transparent practices not just saying so, but you're engaging them. And training is not about just um, you know, again, marking a checkbox or meeting compliance requirements. The number one sort of, uh, uh, area that requires training for LinkedIn research is pause soft skills. So whether you're in the IT industry, actually more so if you're in the IT industry, everybody needs to have cutting edge training to make sure that they bring the best in their own expertise out to the universe. And frankly, you know, at TTA, though we're a provider of training, we're keen on training ourselves as well. We undergo training, we're keen on culture. It's really important to, you know, practice what you preach and to reach out to the learner to deliver the right kind of training, not what we think matters. Uh, what's interesting, this, uh, you know, if you look even at the disparate areas, say museums, they have become way more interactive, again, because they have delved into market research and they want people to be greater participants in what they're seeing to appreciate that experience of the treasures that they have that they're sharing with the people. So this uh, involvement is part of the entire life. I mean, nowadays Netflix is now developing shows that may have different ends depending on how the, the audience votes. So we have to, to think in training in the context of the greater social change and technological development. Hence, the voice of the learner is beyond important. So we were hoping that with the impact of this research study, as we spread this information, similar poll results will be more like in 90 plus percent have asked to hear the voice of the learner. So um a little bit on the how the learners prefer and i'm going to pass here on to amy as she is the lead researcher on the study yes thanks jasmine and thanks for um leading into this so what is it that the learner wants what did they voice well uh shouldn't probably be surprising to any of you that more than half of learners said that they prefer classroom-based instructor-led training uh, again, that is a classic model for learning, so it makes a ton of sense that um, such a large percentage of learners were, were um, kind of drawn to it. Um, we're all really used to this as a paradigm for learning because we've experienced it throughout our formal education and beyond. It's what we kind of tend to think about when we think about education. But with 55% saying they preferred classroom-based training, that leaves another 45% that um, chose something else that indicated a preference um, that was not classroom-based training. So what were they interested in? So 32% um, said that they preferred on-the-job training, and that makes a ton of sense. This is a delivery method that uh, provides learning in the environment where the learner can practice those skills. So for those of you who uh, say that you like to learn by doing or who might prefer practice and observation, this is a method that's going to get at that. Um, and provide that opportunity. This is one where there's really gonna be a learning experience on the job. Moving to the next highest preference was e-learning. Um, and we think that you know, part of the preference here has a lot to do with the autonomy. Um, 
So this method allows choice on the part of the learner. The learner has the opportunity to choose the location um, that he or she is going to access content and often the time and pace um, at which he or she completes that program. So with a little under 30% um, saying that they appreciated that freedom, uh, why might the other 70% not uh, indicate a preference for that method? Um, well, we think that probably because this is a self-paced method, it can be difficult to find time to complete. So if you have a really high demand job, you may um, have more pressing work projects or deadlines that come up and it may find, um, you may find it hard to cut a, um, or save time, cut away some time to complete that e-learning. Um, so these are just the top three. Um, before I move on, I want to mention that we looked at actually over 20 different methods um, that you can use to deliver training, and there's a lot more detail in the report about which ones learners prefer. Um, but again, these are the top three. So uh, those were the top three, generally speaking. So across all kinds of topics and content, these are the ones that learners um, preferred most. But that kind of stuff matters. Learners have different preferences depending on what they're learning and also um, depending on um, the context in which they're in. Um, various methods are going to be more or less impactful depending on that kind of context. So let's take a look at how preferences varied across those areas. To address that, we looked at what learners felt were, was most impactful for enhancing their learning across uh, six common topic areas. So compliance training, customer service, leadership, onboarding, sales, and technical training. And on this slide, you see our learner impact matrix. I'm gonna walk you through what you see here. So um, off to the left, you see a rank of um, effectiveness. This is um, the number one through the number five uh, methods that learners felt were most effective um, for impacting their learning in these content areas. At the top, you see those six common topic areas from compliance to technical training. And um, at the bottom, you see a key that lets you know what each of those um, colorful bubbles mean. So if we were to read this graph um, in the top left uh, for compliance training, on the job training was considered the most impactful method by the learner. So let's focus um, on some of the nuances of this, of this chart. And the first thing I want to look at is on the job training. So again, on the job training was preferred by many learners and they actually, in terms of rating it effectiveness, rated it even more effective for impacting their learning. And that's probably for many of those reasons that I uh, just went over. It provides on-the-job experience, it allows you the opportunity to practice and serve. So there are a lot of good reasons why on-the-job um, training might be impactful for learning. It wasn't considered number one across all of the different topic areas. Um, so uh, it was number one for four out of six, but not for leadership and technical training. So what was? On-the-job coaching. And that makes a ton of sense. On-the-job coaching is likely to be more personalized than on-the-job training. Uh, it tends to be provided by an expert who's going to be really in tune to what the individual needs and, and, and um, has to accomplish in terms of performance. Leadership in particular really lends itself to this kind of format um, in terms of coaching for performance. And similarly, technical training um, really lends itself as well because uh, Technical skills often need more kind of one-on-one -on -one, um, nuanced uh, coaching. What's really interesting about this graph is that even though on-the-job coaching was uh, considered one of the top two methods for enhancing learning um, across five of the six topic areas, it wasn't um, in the top for compliance. Now, it was still in the top five, so certainly wasn't considered um, a, a bad method choice for compliance training, but wasn't as high up. So um, why might that be? Well, compliance training tends to need to be engaging. It needs to provide the learner with opportunities to ask and get answers to questions and to really capture their attention. Um, we all know that compliance training can be a little dry. So techniques that offer um, opportunities to offset some of that and create an engaging experience are likely to be um, impactful for this kind of training. 
And what we saw was that um, that classroom-based instructor-led training was number two here. That makes a lot of sense. When you're in a live classroom environment, it's harder to disengage from content. So um, that's necessarily going to be an engaging experience for you. It also allows you to ask and get answers to the kinds of questions that you might have about compliance um, at the moment that you're learning information. Um, so that's probably another reason why it was um, impactful or considered impactful. And as you see, it was in the top five for all of these different common topic areas. So not only is it the most preferred method, but it also seems to be, um, as far as from the learner's perspective, considered uh, effective at impacting their learning. Okay, so why does that matter? Well, in our research, we found that um, the number one driver of training effectiveness was whether or not it was preferred, it was um, offered through one of uh, learner's preferred method choices. Um, preferences are not simply a, uh, in, in a reflection of what a learner likes or dislikes, but they also tend to represent the realities of the ways in which learners are able to learn, given the context of their job and the types of training they receive. So, um, Ken, you had chatted about uh, learning styles. Learning preferences are definitely different than learning styles because they, um, they vary based on context, based on um, the jobs that learners fill and the types of training that they're going through. Um, and in that way, they kind of represent the learner telling us what's, what's going to work best for me, um, given my context. So our research did show that um, preferences mattered, as I said, by providing training through at least one preferred method you're really dramatically able to impact training effectiveness. And we use multiple regression analyses, controlled for a ton of different demographic variables to look at this. Uh, whether or not training was provided through one preferred method was the number one driver of training effectiveness. So clearly some pretty powerful results there. Um, some other really powerful results that I think Jasmine kind of hinted on when she was um, speaking towards the marketplace and wanting to be competitive for talent, um, and really win that war on talent. Um, we looked at a number of different uh, additional learner outcomes, and we found that when training was provided through at least one of the learner's preferred methods, they were more clear about their job requirements. They also reported being more satisfied with their job. They reported that their jobs were a more central component of their lives, and they reported feeling much more supported by their supervisors. So these are some really big, um, learner characteristics that we're able to impact by simply answering one of their preferred methods or providing one of their preferred methods. So again, that's some really powerful results. And of course, all of this uh, leads into and means that we must have a training strategy when we go into developing and delivering training programs. I'm going to hand it back to Jasmine so that you can um, tell us more about a training strategy. Uh, thank you so much, Amy. Um, and by the way, the report is 55 pages, and it, there's a lot of detail that has gone into it. We can't cover it all in one hour, but we'll, welcome, we'll share a link at the end so you can download it from our website. Uh, but speaking of strategy, I find that very often strategy is the most widely used yet misused word. Strategy has its origins in ancient Rome, where they would actually strategy meant plan for war. Now, hopefully we're living in more peaceful times and we're not planning to go to war with anybody else, but we still need to strategically align our internal troops, our resources to have the outcome. And uh, strategy just does not happen on its own. Strategy must answer the question of what, what it is that needs to be accomplished first, which means strategy has to align with the organizational objectives and vision. You can't just develop a training strategy in a vacuum. Uh, training strategy has to support where your organization wants to be now, the, in five years, uh, what, what changes are on the way, like everybody's talking about robotics, and there will be a war for even greater war for talent, for technology, because that's what every organization is becoming, a technology organization. How many are really are lined up to cater to the needs of the future? That's what's going to make and break the difference. 
Uh, if you look at, for instance, IT training nowadays, it's not just providing the technical training, it's providing also the leadership, the soft skills training that IT professionals have to have to have meaningful uh, uh, conversations within the organization. Are they getting those? How many organizations are really strategically looking at that? And this is just one slice, one sliver of the strategy. You have to have a comprehensive learning strategy. Of course, the best way to have the strategy is to see where you are today, what you have in place, instead of like haphazard, oh, somebody was asking for this training, this regulation came out, we need to put that training in place. Stepping back and evaluating what you have, seeing where your organization strategically needs to be, and then aligning the learning strategy to uh, align with the uh, needs of the strategic Im imperatives of the organization. Fundamentally, those uh, who build a learning organization that continues to learn will do much better than those who have a haphazard approach to learning and training. And again, it, it all lines up within the greater context of what it is that we're trying to do with our training. Another thing that I want to highlight from the report, 55% of people, it's not surprising, they like the uh, ILT, instructor-led training, several reasons for that. Number one, from our earliest age, though now pre-kindergarten is now getting iPads, but in the end, we are so acculturated into the classroom model, which is very helpful because there you can engage in conversations, it's a different interaction, it's truly interactive and evolved, if done right, of course. Having said that, today, with the onslaught of technology that we have, ILT may provide the requisite pause, respite, from all the other diversions that we have and can be also more effective training because it allows people to take a breather, to have that human interaction where they, they really are more in control of the moment, there is more mindfulness to it. So it's not surprising that with the widespread of technology, 55% still prefer instructor-led training. Having said that, what's interesting is there's a 29% of people that like prefer on-the-job training. Well, several reasons for that. A, it has to be relevant to their jobs. People want to be empowered, building on what Amy said, when people know what they need to accomplish and being trained to accomplish what they're expected to accomplish. That's, by the way, the number one uh, predictor of happiness on the job, when people know what they need to do to succeed. That's really important, but let's step back and look at data from outside our research. Uh, Deloitte did a study where they saw that the average uh, manager does not get management training for over 10 years until they are on the job. Well, so this is 10 years of missed opportunity because if you have employees who are looking for on-the-job training and managers are not thinking of themselves as being in the role of providing that training, that's a huge missed opportunity. So this is uh, what the research is showing is that we need to look at training not just within a specific department, but we need to also prep our managers within the organization to provide that on-the-job training that people so desperately need and want. And that's critical to get organizational success, uh, employee retention and engagement. Um, Amy? Yes, I wholeheartedly agree, um, Jasmine. I think there's a lot that goes into training strategy, one of which is, is learner preferences. So, um, again, we invite you to download the report for detailed uh, sharing of the data because we have a lot of detailed slides there with uh, slicing and, and dicing the data. But we also want to know if you have any uh, questions. All right, Jasmine and Amy, we have quite a few questions already in the queue for you. So everyone, if you have any other questions you'd like to ask our, our presenters today, go ahead and pop open that Q&A panel and start typing those in. All right, so I want to first, let's go back to that first slide on the, on the research um, breakdown percentages. Uh, we had some questions there. So Liz wanted to know um, 
his online virtual instructor-led classroom um, training, was that included in instructor-led um, training? Yeah, I'll take that question. Um, thank you, that's an excellent question. Uh, as I mentioned, those were just the top three um, preferred methodologies. Uh, so virtual instructor-led training, we actually pulled that out as a separate kind of method for, um, I'm gonna share my video. Hi all um, for delivering training. So that was a, that was a different method, and it actually did receive quite a few um, votes in terms of being a preferred method. I think it was in the top four. Perfect. Thanks, Amy. Um, and then again on that on that same slide, Rap had a question about how 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 the, the question that you asked the respondent. How was that question asked? Um, it looks like the numbers didn't quite add up to 100%. Yeah, can you go back to that slide, Elizabeth? Yeah, that'd be helpful. So that is a very oh, there you go. And, um, perceptive question. I appreciate it. So we did ask the question as um, a checklist, not rather, um, rather than being first forced choice. We didn't ask them to pick their most preferred method. We said, which of these methods do you prefer? Um, because we know that people might prefer multiple methods and in fact we know that training programs often include multiple methods um, we wanted to get a, a good feel for um, what the learners prefer so 55% said yes I prefer instructor-led training um, that doesn't mean that they didn't also prefer on the job training there's some overlap there but um, instructor-led training was the top method um, in terms of that big list I hope that helps so in a way, it's rating their top preference. It's like asking a person, where do you want to go, Paris or London? And choosing one over the other does not mean that it's an exclusion of the other choice. It means it's equally liked, but this is the number one preference. Right. Perfect. Thanks, ladies. Your next question comes from Rachel, and there are actually a couple of people who asked um, asked this question about the demographics that were that were represented in the respondent. Yeah, I saw some of those in the chat. So um, let me talk a little bit about those. It was, as Jasmine mentioned, over a thousand learners. Um, they had all completed training within the past twelve months. They came from a pretty wide breadth and variety of industries and departments and um, organizational levels. So we really tried hard to uh, capture the voice of learners from entry level positions all the way to the more experienced um, learners that we also provide training to, um, which gets at one of the questions, which is about age. So uh, we had a pretty even breakdown across generational groups. We had our millennials, our boomers, our Gen Xers, and um, that was one of the things that we looked at was differences across generational groups. And um, I know you guys are gonna be receiving a report uh, thanks to TTA. Uh, I don't wanna give away too much, but um, generation actually did not uh, make a big impact in terms of what, what learners preferred. And I'll let you read more about that. Uh, speaking of generations, the, the entire closing session at the Devlin conference that just closed in Las Vegas, was dedicated to generations and how, for the sake of sensationalism, there was so much, sometimes so much uh, emphasis put on generations, but fundamentally we're humans, so there isn't that much difference in how we process the reality. I mean, people may be listening to different bands, but that does not necessarily make a difference in how they learn, so. Okay, your next question comes from Shannon, who is wondering, how do you reconcile the learner preference results with that of the 70-20-10 model? I'm happy to take that one. Um, so, interestingly, we just recently wrapped up a study on the 70-20-10 model here at Training Industry. Um, if you're interested in that, there's a podcast on it and um, also a report available on the website. Um, we did look at preferences for various kinds of methods across the, the formal and the social and um, the on the job, uh, but we did not look at the percentage breakdown. We weren't trying to identify the most appropriate ratios. We didn't ask learners, you know, what, what, how do you prefer or what are your most um, preferred ratios for each of these various kinds of things. 
And again, that is actually a separate study that we have available. Great, thanks, Amy. Um, here's a question that came through chat from Mary. Um, while you were mentioning, you know, training effect effectiveness throughout the presentation, um, how exactly would you define, were you defining effectiveness during the study? That's a great question, Mary. Um, so this is the learner's perception of training effectiveness. Um, and it's asking about how impactful training was um, in terms of impacting their actual job relevant uh, performance. So um, not, not all of their job performance, but the performance that's relevant to the type of training that they receive. So it is a perception from the learner. Um, and it, it does get at kind of how well they think the training impacted their performance post-training because all of these learners had completed training previously. And you saw a correlation, right, between pre preference in learning and the effectiveness of the learning. Yeah, absolutely. Not only was there a really strong correlation, but um, when we did a multiple regression analysis and threw a whole bunch of other really important variables in there, we saw that the number one predictor was um, whether or not it was provided through their preferred training um, method. So again, a pretty powerful um, statistical result. Hence the whole uh, focus of the study, when people feel that the, they're being trained in their preferred methodology, their perception of effectiveness also goes up. Exactly. All right, great. Thanks, ladies. Let's see here. Here is a question from Laura who asks, how do you how did you measure the effectiveness of training other than the learner's preference? So Laura, that was our method of measuring effectiveness, was their perspective. However, we also asked those additional um, uh, uh, looked at those additional kind of more distal outcome variables, job satisfaction, how clear they were about their work role requirements, um, their perception of their supervisor's support, and, and also how central work, uh, their job or work lives were um, to their, their sense of kind of being. So um, again, we saw a dramatic relationship between how they rated training effectiveness and those dis more distal outcomes. Um, so, as with any uh, uh, study, we have to look at correlations and, and understand that uh, correlation doesn't necessarily imply causation. But we did control for some of that statistically, and we think that the, um, that the direction of that relationship, um, or our best hypothesis, that the direction of the relationship is that by providing training through one of their preferred methodologies, we're able to impact training effectiveness, which then um, has those more distant uh, ripple effects on work lives. Um, another factor that I'd like to talk about, this whole effectiveness perception, a lot of it has to do also with internal communication on how the value of training and learning is communicated within the organization. How, are we engaging people into this process or are they just is it happening in a haphazard way where you get an email? So getting that communication in place also makes a difference for learning and training outcomes. And again, for the engagement of employees in the organization. One of the key things that we're trying to accomplish with the learnings from this is to drive organizational change where training comes out from a back office into the front lobby and shines because it has a very critical role to play in employee engagement within the organization. It's changing our overall cultural awareness of the importance of training and learning organizationally. So that there, there are huge uh, repercussions for that for organizational culture and success. Perfect. Here is a question from Liz, who is wondering if you have an example of a learning strategy since you emphasize the importance of it so much. Um, I'll take that. We did a very successful undertaking, for instance, at TTA with uh, Girl Scouts of Kentucky, and we even won a gold, uh, Brandon Hall Gold Award for that. It started out initially as a single workforce training session 
thankfully our instructor whom we sent on the engagement is a very bright woman who very quickly figured out that there was more to this organization and more training was needed and hey, hey they needed training strategy rather than just one-off learning so she said let's step back it turned into a full-blown leadership development program they focused on clifton strengths it's created an organizational change and then the stats from that again we have the study on our website uh, trainingassociates.com show tremendous differences in employee retention so they went from a one-off course to developing a holistic learning strategy and that made a world of difference for that organization and now it's been so successful that other uh you know girl scout organizations are taking this on so that there are huge learnings in that again it's stepping back it's being strategic it's not dealing with the one-offs but seeing what is the whole course of action where are we going to go with this? How is this supporting our organization? And training is a huge tool. And again, I said strategy comes from war. So it's also a weapon for good. Um, I don't know if that's a contradiction in terms. Probably is, but it, 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 there is power to uh, looking at training from a strategic perspective rather than one of, oh, we need to do this course, we need to do that course. Great, thanks, Jasmine. Lots of questions coming in here. Uh, here is one from Libby who says, so you mentioned companies that have, a lear have learning cultures to promote ongoing learning are at an advantage. How do you recommend creating a learning culture when you are starting from scratch in an organization? Oh my goodness, that's the most fantastic place to start because you can actually do a lot of experimentation Part of it, and there are bigger socio, uh, socio psychological issues here, is that we're a culture, we're a country of success in the United States. We, from first grade on, we're told to succeed. We have to know our ABCs, we have to know everything. By the time we are employees in a corporation, almost no one has any room to ever fail. And when that happens, and if we don't learn how to fail, much less fail fast, we have a situation where people are only going for the tried and true, but as you know, bigger social frameworks change and they're not learning organizations. So let's say what was working 20 years ago will not be necessarily working today. A classic example of stopping to learn is how the New England ice manufacturers, none of them as technology advanced, none of them embraced refrigeration. So this is a big issue. So organizations, when you're starting from scratch, creating a sandbox where you can be doing pilots, learning to fail, that's huge. In the US, probably the most failing prone culture is out in Silicon Valley, which has brought out so much innovation that we're literally using every single day from the iPhone to PayPal. Uh, having said that, now there are research reports that even that's not progressing fast, and those centers of innovation are now moving to India and China. So having tolerance, to be a learning organization, you have to be absolutely willing to learn. And sometimes when you're learning, you, you don't do everything absolutely right. Johnson & Johnson is a good example. Their R&D department every year launches 180 new products, yet they know for sure that only five of those 180 products will succeed. That's a very small margin, except they do not know which 5%, which five, not 5%, 5 will succeed. The five that do succeed take big to the market. So again, but they have this built-in expectation. So you cannot be learning if you're constantly gunning for absolute certainty. So it's being able to deal with uncertainty, living in the, in the age of unreason and uncertainty, being agile, and being able to deal with ambivalent situations. Pretty much everything is ambivalent in many ways. So building that culture will allow organizations to succeed. And even in training, you have to constantly experiment. It's not a one size fits all. Uh, one of the things that we thrive on at CTA, we take a very customized approach. We, we, we're sometimes technology agnostic, we're methodology agnostic, as long as it contextually works for each organization, because whatever you do, has to contextually work for that organization specifically, for that point in time. That's why we're so huge on talking about context. 
And even within the context of this uh, webinar, we're talking about context because we can't take people, uh, you know, study findings even outside the context. You have to look all of it in its holistic model as to what's happening socially and technologically and broadly in organizations. Great, thanks, Jasmine. Here's a question from Larry who says, given that a group of learners may have a broad mix of learning styles, who would you suggest designing the course when you may not have been able to pull preferences in advance? I assume with a mix of preferred styles? Um, a lot of it, I mean, you don't wanna have a hodgepodge either, but a lot of it is creating engagement and having people's voices be heard. You could do a small internal call, you could understand. By the way, it's not so much about learning styles, as you see, we've been talking about learning preferences. Uh, fundamentally, actually, unlike what people say, most people can learn in most ways, except, again, we have our own perceptions. You know, you'll hear somebody say sometimes, oh, I'm a visual learner. Oh, I'm an auditory learner. But truthfully, everybody, if they're capable, is every kind of learner is, again, feeling included, feeling engaged, and being put in the correct context for learning. And again, having a learning organization where experimenting, being open to new things, trying something new is a learning experience. Yeah, and if I could add um, or, or piggyback on what you said, Jasmine, um, I think if you don't have the opportunity to pull the learner, uh, there are a couple of options. So. Um, First, that slide um, where we saw the top three, instructor-led, e-learning, and on-the-job, those are the best bets in terms of what learners most prefer. Um, I was just recently at a conference where uh, one of the speakers said, you can't please everybody all the time because you're not a taco, um, which really resonated with me because I like tacos. Um, but uh, my, my thought here is that if you do provide those, you're more likely to hit on what a majority of learners want. Um, the other point that I would make is that learners really, um, their preferences really did reflect the realities of their jobs. So if they um, had highly demanding jobs or um, the learners who said that they had a lot of direct reports, they tended to prefer more virtual kind of self-paced um, training methods, probably because they were trying to fit them into their day. Um, so here I would say, try to get into the mindset of the learner. Even if you don't have time to go ask each individual learner what they want, um, try to get a, get a feel for what they're faced with in their job and, and think through kind of if you were in that position, what might you want um, to get at what's going to be uh, their best access point for content given what they're faced with. And to be piggyback on what Amy just said, another big thing that's missing in both the learning strategy and how learning is done is the why behind it. As human beings, we like to know why we're being asked to do something, whereas it's probably one of the most underused words in the English language or the psychology behind the why. There are amazing sociopsychological experiments where you tell people without even explaining the whole thing, just use the word because, the buy-in increases. So explaining to people why they're being asked to learn something, that in itself will make a huge difference in the organizational and the employee engagement of engaging with that training and the learning. And just generally being positive about learning, because frankly, the day we stop to learn is the day we have officially died in my mind, uh, because the day we are not learning, we're not evolving, it's the beginning of the end. So creating a culture that embraces learning, that's a good thing. Like, there's nothing negative to it. It's just, we shouldn't, the learning professionals should not come at it from a place of fear, but rather from a place of pride and embracing it and championing it throughout the organization. It's only a good thing. Great, thanks ladies. Now on the flip side of that question from Larry, if you have been able to, or you are able to pull preferences in advance, um, what would you recommend are some good assessment or survey methods and what mediums give you the best analytic reporting outcomes? Amy, you go first and then I'll take it. 
Yeah, I mean, here at Trading Industry, we don't ever want to endorse um, any particular organization or, or um, assessment provider. So um, what I would recommend, we have an excellent list of uh, top 20 companies that um, companies apply every year for um, our various top 20 list, and they are vetted by a, a panel of experts. I would recommend looking at the um, top 20 assessment and evaluation list on our website. Um, I think that that's a good resource to get you started. I also recommend um, polling your peers, finding out what they're using and what's working for them. And with that, I, I will turn it to you, Jasmine, to hear what, what you might have to say. Kind of building on what Amy is saying, uh, what the study shows is people are really hungry for that human engagement. With both the preference for ILT and OJT on the job training, people are looking to have that conversation, that engagement. And it's easy to point a finger and say, oh, ma ma managers are not engaged enough. Truthfully, managers on average now are managing seven people as opposed to four in 2000. So all of this has implications for people's time. But again, having an opportunity to have that conversation, uh, starting certain practices, at least either the managers have open door policies or having a chunk of time where they have an open door, uh, encouraging a conversation because the trainer preferences have shown clearly that people want to have that connection, that conversation, that makes a difference. Because at the end of the day, no matter how much technology we bring in, humans are con will continue being humans. And what defines us as humans is that social psychological need for connection. Excellent point. All right, great. Let's see, here is a question from Brian who says, the preference slide on the presentation appears to suggest a preference for blended learning over all other individual standalone methodologies. Is this your assumption as well? So I'll speak to um, the research and then Jasmine, I'm sure you have something to add about, about you know, the, the benefit of blended learning. Um, we actually asked um, in particular about the number of methods that learners were um, receiving training through. Uh, we found pretty consistently across numerous research studies here at training industry that um, training programs tend to include more than one method or modality. So I know some of you asked about um, instructor-led training that might include some kind of a simulation or role play or videos. Um, and that is absolutely the case. And we consider that multimodal training. It means that um, they're getting content through various kinds of methods, lecture plus some other additional add-ons. Um, what we found is that when training is provided through multiple methods, shocker, um, you're more likely to hit learners' preferences or you're more likely to provide um, one of the methods that learners prefer. So um, not only are we providing uh, training through multiple methods, but that's actually a really good thing because it's more likely to hit on learners' preferences, um, which I think kind of gets at that need to blend uh, different kinds of experiences. So um, absolutely correct, Amy. And in today's environment where everybody has all these gadgets at their fingertips, Blended learning is a de facto kind of standard in a way, even with ILT. When, you, when you're directing them to some kind of an online module, when you're doing certain gamification uh, ex related exercises, it becomes blended learning. So, but the importance is that human connection that brings all of that together. But it's really hard to get away from blended t uh, learning today, again, because we're so tied into technology as being a normal. Great, okay, it looks like we have time for maybe two more questions here. Uh, let's see, this one is from Lauren. She asks, what suggestions do you have in max maximizing effectiveness for companies that have to rely on virtual ILT due to participant size? Go ahead, Amy. Uh, yeah, I'll go first. Um, so um, I think that virtual instructor-led training is an excellent way to deliver content. Um, I, one suggestion would be to incorporate that, that multiple modality where possible. So if we're in this kind of virtual setting, um, and in particular if it's lengthy, so um, let's say it's a four-hour session, um, provide a ton of breaks, um, provide some, some ways to break things up. So videos can be a really great way to break up um, the lecture, also group discussions, 
breakout sessions that help to simulate what it's like to be in a real classroom environment. Um, the other suggestion I would have is to really work on um, how you're reinforcing content outside of that virtual session. So maybe you don't have a ton of methodologies available to you, but Perhaps you have um, the ability to send a reminder email to practice some skill set or to revisit the goals that you set as part of your virtual training. Um, and, and those kinds of reinforcement tactics are going to also help the learner to and continue that learning experience outside of the session. Absolutely. And building on what Amy said, it's about building engagement in a way. Jazz people up so they're excited about the training. I mean, people, it's a global, uh, you know, universe. A lot of people are all over the different countries. So maybe have people get together, I don't know, 10 of them, 20 of them in one room, serve popcorn or whatever local snack you want. Create some kind of engagement and excitement about the training. So people are looking forward to it rather than like, oh my God, same old, same old. Again, it's the kind of excitement that we can create about learning because we know that's the recipe that will help your organization succeed into the future. If you have a learning organization, you will succeed. If you don't have a learning organization, you might as well, you know, find your own plot somewhere in the corporate cemetery because the excitement about training, organizations that integrate training into their evolution path are going to be way more successful than those who do not. Who do not. Uh, and that's the number one uh, predictor of overall organizational success. The training cannot be in the back room. It has to be out in the front. You think of it as a float, you know, on Thanksgiving Day Parade, which is coming up. All right, great. Let's let's try to take one more question here. Um, this one's from Charlotte, and she says, "Do you think that employees who work remotely or work in organizations that has many remote employees tend to prefer online training because that is what they receive most often due to monetary constraints?" So, Charlotte, yes, I think that's a that's a good hypothesis. Um, what we found in our research was that uh, learners were more likely to prefer a method if they had been exposed to it in the past. Um, hence, classroom-based training being our number one preferred method. Um, there's definitely a correlation between if it's what you're most exposed to, you're used to it, um, you have a preference for it. Uh, one thing that I would say as kind of a takeaway from that is that when you are introducing something new that they aren't used to, it's really important to, um, as Jasmine was saying earlier, use that word because tell them what the training method is and why you're using it and, and why they might expect to uh, really get a lot out of engaging with that method. Um, I have, for instance, been in a lot of situations where you're introducing new technology, new content management system, completely new approaches to content, and it's in a global setting. So a British organization that I worked at was really good about the pomp and circumstance, they would say and was really organizationally accepted because the outcomes would then follow to bring those people in for centralized training to uh, you know, kind of telegraph the importance of that training to people and then they, they could go on and continue. But kind of putting the pomp and circumstance behind training really worked out because the organization was widely distributed globally with about 40,000 employees, four and a half billion in revenue, but they needed to get that attention and it would come in clusters and the importance they placed on training had huge impact on the bottom line and on success of the endeavors that they were launching. So it's really important to not think just, oh, so-and-so is a remote employee. Let's, I mean, it's a try trace to say think outside the box, but literally thinking outside the box is really important for that. Great. Thanks so much, ladies. That is all the time we have for today. So thank you again for sharing your time and giving us such a great conversation today. Thanks for having thank us. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for joining from far and wide. Appreciate it. All right. Great, everyone. Just a few closing remarks from me. I would like to invite you all to join us for some upcoming training industry webinars. You can find out what's next, register for an event, or watch past webinars now at trainingindustry.com. And as a reminder, all of our webinars are pre-qualified for credit hour by ISPI, SHRM, and CPTM. 
What is CPTM? It is the Certified Professional and Training Management Program that assists you in developing core competencies that will empower you to manage the future training needs of your organization. You can participate in a number of practicums held within the U.S. or join a virtual practicum from anywhere in the world. Find out more information at trainingindustry.com slash CPTM. And I would love to meet you all in person next June here in Raleigh, North Carolina for the 2019 Training Industry Conference and Expo. You'll learn from and network with your peers over three packed days of learning at Tice, where we create a conference that is the right size and focus for learning leaders. Register now to take advantage of our super early bird rates and learn more at tice2019.com. And just one quick reminder that a survey should have popped open in another tab in your browser. And we would greatly welcome your feedback. Once again, thanks to our presenters, Jasmine and Amy, and of course, our sponsor, TTA, known as the Training Associates. Thanks to all of you for attending today. For Training Industry, I'm Elizabeth Parker, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.